First of all, uh, my name is James Lee, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology. I'm also a Wasteman Center investigator. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, about, uh, about myself more as we go on in this presentation, but I did want to um, first just sort of acknowledge and thank the uh, Autism Society and the Friends of the Wasteman Center for sponsoring this wonderful event. Um, this is my second day with the experts, and it's truly my honor and privilege to speak with the experts, the, the true experts being those in the room and those with lived experiences. Um, I also want to resonate with something that Dr. Durkin mentioned early on in her presentation, which is that um, in, the, in the years since my first day with the experts, which was a few years ago, a lot has changed. Uh, and I've learned quite a lot in interacting with those in the community. And I want to talk a little bit about some of those changes, those very seismic changes, in my opinion, in terms of the science of autism and, and uh, ADHD as well, which is uh, my area of research. And, and I'll tell you how um, my focus on ADHD has really changed and shifted along with some of the views in uh, autism as well. So uh, with that out of the way, I want to tell you a little bit about um, my academic journey. So my background is in clinical psychology. So I have a PhD. Uh, uh, in clinical psychology, I went to graduate school with a focus on uh, studying ADHD in particular. And one reason why I was so interested in ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is that it is incredibly common. In fact, it is uh, the most common neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder of childhood. Um, roughly one in 10 children are diagnosed with ADHD, not just in the US, but actually worldwide. And you could see the trend lines here have only gone up over time. Um, it's also very debilitating. It affects, obviously, learning. It affects social uh, interactions that kids are forming during their very formative years. Uh, and so I was really motivated to study this very common debilitating disorder in childhood. So I went to graduate school with that emphasis. I must have conducted well over uh, 500 ADHD evaluations during my clinical training as a graduate student. I worked in an ADHD lab, and that's what we did. Um, and so I've, I've done all of the neuropsych assessments that are typically entailed in an ADHD evaluations. Um, I also did a dissertation on gene environment interactions underlying ADHD. And so I like to think that I know quite a bit about ADHD. Um, however, part of my training also entailed working in the community and actually working directly with uh, people directly with uh, families and, and kids with ADHD. And during my, my, my clinical experiences, I learned that there was really no strong translation between the things that I was seeing in the clinic, the kids that I was actually treating and doing assessments with, and the research that I was writing. And what do I mean by that? On the clinical side, I noticed that kids with ADHD presented with a whole lot of complexity. Uh, no two children with ADHD ever looked alike. And there's a good reason for that is because there's a lot of different heterogeneity or presentations of ADHD that one can present. And in the next uh, speaker, you're gonna see, hear a lot more about the different types of presentations that ADHD has. Um, furthermore, in the clinic, when we're doing assessments, we don't typically just assess for ADHD. We're also looking at or, or for potentially other co-occurring conditions as well. And it turns out that most kids with ADHD are also presenting with some other signs and symptoms of perhaps depression, anxiety disorders, OCD. Maybe they don't meet full diagnostic criteria for it, but there's always or usually some underlying uh, impairment in some of these other psychiatric domains as well. And so co-occurring conditions with ADHD were normative rather than exceptional. And this complexity really reflects the human experience. And yet, when I go back into the lab in front of my computer screen, I'm doing these research studies where we're looking at ADHD in a complete vacuum. We're basically eliminating uh, participants who have other co-occurring conditions because we want to study ADHD on its own and we really want to study the origins and the causes of ADHD so we can treat ADHD minus everything else. And that doesn't reflect reality. And so uh, that's really um, sort of the, the challenge that I had during my, my clinical training years was to try to reconcile this difference that I was noticing between what was happening in the real world and what we were doing in our research. And that sort of has led me to uh, thinking about 
my research a little differently. And in the last few years, I think um, it's really become more crystallized in the, the things that have been happening in the field of mental health. And I'm going to share with you two major seismic land, uh, landscape shifts uh, that have occurred in terms of our perspectives about mental health. Um, so first of all, as I started my lab here at the Wasteman Center almost a decade ago now, um, I had, uh, you know, still that interest in studying ADHD, but I could not avoid the fact that ADHD cannot be studied in a vacuum, right? I knew this based on my clinical experience. And one of the, the most co-occurring conditions that I saw along with ADHD was, as you heard earlier uh, from Maureen Durkin's uh, presentation on prevalence rates, is uh, autism. ADHD and autism commonly co-occur with each other. Now, you can cite one study or another study, and you're, you might get different estimates, right? Um, so I actually like to use meta-analyses of studies, which actually combine the estimates of multiple studies conducted on prevalence rates. And what uh, these pooled estimates usually come out to is somewhere between or somewhere around 40 percent, meaning that the, the prevalence of ADHD and autism is somewhere around 40 percent. Um, I think Maureen Durkin's uh, data showed it was closer to 60 percent. So that's well within the range there. But it's really, really common, this co-occurrence. Um, the reason why it's important to think about uh, co-occurrence and complexity within both autism and ADHD together is that when you think about this complexity, this co-occurrence, um, impairments that come with that, that co-occurrence are a lot greater. So autistic children with ADHD um, have two to three times higher risk for developing other psychiatric conditions as well, like anxiety and mood disorders. And this is also, this is relative to kids without that co-occurring ADHD diagnosis, autistic kids without that co-occurring diagnosis. Um, there's also very lasting, long lasting uh, impairments that happen after the years of childhood. So I know there was a question about um, how does this look as, as autistic individuals age? And we see that um, autistic adults with ADHD are also more likely to suffer from unemployment, they have worse health outcomes, and suffer from more severe illnesses and auto, uh, autoimmune disorders as well. So this is obviously a very important consideration when we're thinking about the autism diagnosis is those co-occurring conditions, especially ADHD. Okay, so um, what do we do if we know that a child uh, who's a, a, an autistic child has an ADHD diagnosis? Well, we would like to treat the ADHD ideally, right? However, our current treatments for ADHD are not really that great for autistic kids in particular. That's because many of these treatments were designed with studies that just treated ADHD in a vacuum. Um, so in this case, we know that at least the data uh, uh, suggests that the majority of autistic kids with ADHD are prescribed medications, as one would do when somebody has a, a diagnosis of ADHD. And 40% of autistic uh, youths are actually given more than one psychotropic medication. However, there's really not great evidence to support the efficacy of ADHD medications, primarily stimulant medications, among those who are autistic. In fact, there are some studies that show that autistic youths with ADHD actually respond quite poorly relative to non-autistic youths with ADHD to stimulant medication. So first of all, I should note that there aren't that many studies to begin with looking at this population in terms of stimulant medication efficacy rates, but those that are out there don't really have strong evidence to support that the same treatments that we would give to neurotypical children would work for autistic children with ADHD. Um, but I actually think talking about treatment might be getting ahead of ourselves because it's sort of like putting the, the person in front of the horse here. We first need to have a good sense of whether or not we're identifying autism and ADHD precisely and accurately in the first place before we get, we get to treatment. And that's actually one area where the field is very far behind. Um, now, one reason is because you actually couldn't have a diagnosis of autism and ADHD up until 2013 when the DSM-5 revised that, that guidance. Uh, so that set the science back quite a lot, such that we now have to catch up with this new guidance that you're actually allowed to have this diagnosis. But there's another layer of complexity here, which is uh, has to do with the timing of the diagnosis. So one issue with um, diagnosing ADHD and autism in particular is that the timing doesn't quite line up. Uh, a typical age of diagnosis in autism is quite early, right around age three. And we usually try to identify this early so that interventions can begin earlier. Um, but you don't 
do that in ADHD. In fact, it's against most guidelines to be diagnosing a three or four year old with ADHD because it's a very contextual disorder, much like uh, autism, in fact, similarly. Um, that's because many of the symptoms of ADHD need to be observed in multiple settings. And one of those settings typically happen to be in the school setting for which a three or four year old is not typically expected to be in a school setting for which they need to sit still for many hours of a day. Uh, and so that makes it really challenging for clinicians, especially clinicians who are looking for autism, is to also look for ADHD at the same time because they're actually kind of precluded from looking and diagnosing ADHD at such an early age. Now, that doesn't mean that we may not be able to pick up signs of ADHD at age three or four, uh, but we don't quite have the tools to be able to pick up on those things accurately because that child is not in the setting for, for which those symptoms to express. That is, the you know, in particular, the school. So one of the things that we're trying to learn more about is, well, how do we shift our uh, ability, our measures to be able to pick up on signs for ADHD and other co-occurring conditions for that matter a little bit earlier? All right. I think my time is is running, so I'm going to try to speed through this. Um, it's really difficult to diagnose ADHD and autism. You're going to hear more about that later. Uh, and some of the reasons why that's the case is because some of the, the symptoms of ADHD seem to look a lot like autism features. Um, one example in ADHD is the symptom called does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. And those of you in the room who are familiar with the autism diagnosis can, can already tell that this might be an ADHD inattention symptom, or it could just be a reflection of potential difficulties in social skills to engage or disengage with interactions. And so it's hard to tease these things apart for a clinician. It's hard to tease these things apart for parents. And so it really challenges, it makes it very challenging to, to identify these two things together. So um, I want to talk about how uh, new perspectives in mental health and in autism have, I think, helped us make this research a little bit better. Um, and so that not only are we more compassionate about autism and the autism experience, but that the science of autism is better too. So one perspective that has uh, influenced our research here at the Weissman Center is um, neurodiversity. So I, I, I believe most people in this room are quite familiar with this, but to be honest with you, many clinical psychologists are not. Uh, and that's because we're trained to think from a very medical deficits oriented lens. And I myself was trained, is trained as a clinical psychologist. And, and so um, one thing that we've had to really change in our perspective as psychologists in our science of thinking about autism is not just viewing things from a deficits lens. And so many of the symptoms in the DSM-5 for autism are written with the word deficit in it. And in fact, you could replace that word with differences, and it would not be considered an impairment at all, depending on the context. And yet we have historically, as psychologists and psychiatrists, viewed things as difference, differences as being deficits. And that's not always the case. And I think what we've learned from the community, the autism community, is that always viewing differences as deficits can be very toxic to this community. And so um, just as a quick reminder, the neurodiversity paradigm uh, suggests that autism is a part of natural variation, right? So we celebrate and can celebrate diversity rather than uh, thinking about things as deficits. Uh, typical neurodevelopment is neither superior nor inferior to divergent neurodevelopment. Neurodiversity helps to create a healthy and sustainable cognitive environment and that there are no right or wrong brains and all forms of neurodevelopment are equally valid. Now, again, this very much goes contrary to what, how we've historically viewed autism. Um, so there's another major perspective that has come online recently in mental health more broadly, and that is the idea that uh, mental health disorders, well, let me first start with saying that we've traditionally viewed mental health disorders as something that you either have or you don't. So this figure here I know is completely blurry to most of you, and that's totally fine. This is actually a visual representation of every single disorder of the DSM-5. And there are over 300 of them. And the current paradigm in mental health and psychiatry is that each one of these disorders is discrete and totally distinct from the other. Uh, and you either have one of them or you don't. 
Um, so each one has its own symptoms and criteria, and by extension, each one has its own etiology that you can study. And of course, by extension from there, each one has its own treatments that you would treat for. And that's sort of what I was alluding to earlier when I was talking about studying ADHD in a vacuum. All 300 of these historically have been studied in a vacuum, irrespective of the co-occurrence of other things. Um, However, and, and actually this is just a, a, a very similar slide to what was shown earlier, um, that's kind of an absurd view of the science and also the practice of mental health or treatment of mental health because most patients, most clients are complex and come with um, multiple impairments or struggles across the spectrum. And uh, this is especially true in the case of autism where the co-occurrence of ADHD and autism is very high, but so too do you see the co-occurrence of other psychiatric conditions as well. So a new way of thinking about it in mental health that's emerged over the last half decade um, is thinking about instead of individual categories representing distinct you know, disorders with distinct treatments, so rethink them as dimensions instead that all sort of kind of align together and all seem to share very similar features with one another. So there's a reason why depression and anxiety tend to go together is because they all seem to share, share the same set of cognitive and behavioral features. There's a reason why ADHD and autism tend to co-occur quite commonly is because they all share very similar features with one another in terms of symptoms and behavioral expressions. And it turns out they also share a lot of etiological factors as well. And that's part of what has informed our research at the Weissman Center is that even the genetic and neurobiological origins of these disorders that co-occur frequently are very, very similar. And for us to be studying them different, uh, uh, separately might actually be um, quite inefficient in the way that we're thinking about treatments and diagnosis and things like that. So um, I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty of how we've sort of come to this conclusion, other than to say that there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies that now support the idea that when you look at all the different disorders of the DSM, they all tend to cluster together in these sort of categories or these large dimensions that you see here. And it turns out that there aren't 300 different dimensions, but really no more than five, uh, which, which allows us to, to be a lot better about thinking uh, about how people vary across these dimensions rather than whether you have something or you don't. Okay, so real quickly, I want to uh, share with you a little bit about um, the Wasteman Center's, uh, one, one of the Wasteman Center's research projects that reflects these two new perspectives uh, in thinking about autism and mental health more broadly. And that's in the UW Link study that. Um, uh, myself and Brittany Travers are the PIs of, and, and Chang Chang is the center PI, so he oversees the uh, the uh, the P50 uh, center grant for the Wasteman Center. So this is part of the, the Wasteman Center center grant. Um, the primary motivation behind our study was really to first tackle this one issue that I brought up earlier regarding the co-occurrence of ADHD among autistic kids, which is that it's really difficult to diagnose ADHD in an autistic kid when the autistic child is coming in for that evaluation at age three, but you can't make that ADHD evaluation definitively until they're right around age seven usually. And so what we wanted to do in our, our research study was really to embrace the heterogeneity and the complexity of autism. So instead of screening out ADHD, instead of screening out co-occurring conditions like so many autism studies have done in the past, we actually invite autistic kids who are coming with more complex presentations, who might vary in their IQ, and who especially vary in their ADHD expressions at that early age. And what we're also looking for is not just assessing the behaviors that they're expressing that might look like ADHD, but we're also looking at some of these other features as well, like their cognition, their, their other behaviors, their brain structures and microstructures, their DNA. And we're trying to get this sort of holistic, multidimensional view where we don't just rely on our eyeballs to help us make that diagnosis, but we're also incorporating these other biological features that we know are very relevant in the uh, origins and the development of autism and ADHD as well. Um, so it's uh, the UW Link study because it stands for longitudinal imaging and neurogenetics. We're taking this sort of multidimensional view to, to study autism uh, and ADHD development among autistic youths. We are still recruiting. So please partner with us if you're very interested in this type of work. 
Um, it's a longitudinal study, so it's happening over three years, and we're still recruiting to this day. This is um, just sort of an overview of the, the types of uh, aims that we have within our research uh, study. Um, I realize I am pretty much over time. So uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to share with you, but I, this is more of a teaser now for you if you are interested, come check out our website, uh, come come email me afterwards uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we found. But uh, I alluded to this earlier, which is that um, the genetic component or the neurobiology of autism and ADHD are incredibly shared, very commonly shared, or, or I should say very much overlapping. And um, when we start to utilize uh, the information that we've learned in the genetics of autism and combine that with what we learned in the genetics of ADHD, two very heritable disorders and conditions, we're learning that actually we can take that information from the lab and apply that in terms of diagnosis, meaning that we can have some degree of confirmation that our DNA is supporting what we might be seeing in the clinic. Now, by no means does this mean that we can use just DNA to ever, ever diagnose or predict somebody's autism or ADHD. Not at all. What this is actually providing us with is an additional tool that we may be able to use to supplement those really, really rigorous observations and assessments that we're doing so that we can do a little bit better at making that ADHD diagnosis a little bit earlier without just relying on those questionnaires. So that's what I want to be clear about. Um, so I think, unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip through <laughs> all of these slides, which is um, evidence that we've we've been able to uh, uh, procure in terms of our data analysis to show that the, the, the genetic component of autism and ADHD can be very valuable in the assessment um, process. We think that this could be one way that we can start to create more efficient uh, diagnostic protocols that, again, don't just rely on observations, which are prone to error, but also can start to rely on some of the, the neuroscience findings that have been coming out and the genetic findings that have been coming out. All right, so I will end there um, and just say that this has been a huge labor uh, uh, among many, many people who have been involved in this type of work. Um, this is a, a snapshot of the, the UW Link study team that's been involved in data collection. It's still ongoing. If you do have any questions, uh, and I'm sure you do, please uh, feel free to email me afterwards and I'll be sure to share with you additional information about our research. Thanks. <laughs> I think we have time for um, at least one or two questions. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. When I was in high school, um, I was socially thrust into the underworld of the student body that was not being able to access special education services. In that student body, I actually observed a major discrepancy in success between those that pretty much had the symptoms of autism and ADHD and just ADHD. My question to you, have any studies been done about success differences between people with just ADHD versus autism and ADHD? That's a great question. So um, just to kind of re repeat the question a little bit, it's have there been any studies that have looked at success outcomes, I guess, broadly construed among individuals with ADHD and autism relative to those with just ADHD? Is that right? Yeah, so um, I have a couple of responses to this. Um, probably, <laughs> however, I think some of those studies, especially pre like 2000, should be viewed with a, a good sense of caution or good degree of caution for one reason, or for several reasons, but one in particular. Um, in studies that have typically parsed out groups like that, autism and ADHD versus ADHD only or autism only, I think it sort of assumes that those who have autism only or ADHD only are truly just that. And that that's sort of um, what has inspired the, the UW Link study is that it's it's a really complex phenotype, right? There's a lot of different presentations even within ADHD. And what we're learning and what I've certainly learned in my own clinical experience is that there is really no such thing as an ADHD kid. 
nor is there such a thing as, a, as an autistic kid in, in that every autistic kid is an individual. And I think that there's inherently just a lot of heterogeneity, enough heterogeneity within these groupings, such that whatever we do find, I think may not is, is not easily replicated uh, when you do that study again. And a lot of it boils down to context, you know, situation. So while I'm sure that there are studies like that, and I don't know any off the top of my head that have looked at outcome measures, um, I do think that I, I usually view them with a healthy dose of skepticism because of just this within group heterogeneity that exists within autism. So I've I've really tried to adopt more of this sort of dimensional view that we, sh we ought to be looking at um, the full picture of mental health beyond, you know, any one or two constructs. Okay, any, oh. <laughs> All right. Um, I was just curious with your research, have you found with the genetic component, um, families that have multiple children that are presenting autism and ADHD? I have two boys that for sure, well, one's too young to be diagnosed with ADHD, but they both have autism and um, we think ADHD too. And then a daughter that was older and presented her symptoms mm. differently. So she didn't get diagnosed, but we have a feeling she also is um, has autism and possibly ADHD too. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question. The question was about if we've done any research or have looked into um, the possibility of epigenetic influences that might um, either predict or underlie the, the co-development of ADHD and autism. Um, not in our research, no. We haven't looked into epigenetic influences. Um, I, I have a, a, a particular philosophy around uh, epigenetic research, which I think is incredibly valuable and very important, but it's also incredibly complicated because one of the things about um, epigenetics on top of genetics is what it means, is that there's the supposition that whatever is happening on top of the genome, which is what epigenetic influences are, it's being caused by something in the environment. And I, I'm very interested in gene environment interactions, how these two things uh, inter intertwine with one another to influence gene expression. However, it's really difficult in the lab to isolate why this particular gene was influenced or how that particular gene expression got influenced because we don't know what context was responsible for gene expression at that site. And so um, we've really focused more on understanding things at the genetic level first, because we do want to understand first, you know, what are the genes that are working here that might contribute to ADHD in autism, um, which might be different uh, than the genes that are responsible or, or just related to attention or social communication, what have you. Um, so I think there's a lot of really cool work that's being done in the epigenetic space. I'm not as familiar with it, uh, but I also think that there's a lot of complexity to interpreting those results that I really haven't seen um, too much that has, has gotten me convinced that any one environmental factor has contributed to the gene expression at that site. Yeah. Is there, should we move on or one more? Oh, we can do one more. Okay. I, I hate to have to um, <laughs> stay to the schedule, but um, yes, one more question. Um, kind of to bounce off that, how common is it right now for um, people in the community to receive that genetic testing mm. um, outside of a research space? Oh, wow. For diagnostic. Um, yeah. So how, how the question is, how common is it in the, for folks in the community to have access to genetic testing um, and things that we're doing in our lab? Um, this is a, a great question. I'm actually teaching a class right now on genetics and ethics. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. this depends. So anyone in the community can theoretically access or can theoretically um, access a genetic report on their on themselves or on their their offspring even, and there are really no rules or regulations around the kinds of information that certain companies can provide. So you, many of you have heard of companies like Twenty Three and Me um, that that do ancestry reports for for those of you who are willing to share your DNA with them. Um, but there are also other companies that are around as well that can take the same DNA and provide you with a, what's called a comprehensive health assessment that takes genetic 
information that we've learned about all kinds of um, traits and conditions and disorders and tells you back what your risk is based on our understanding about the genes that are linked to those kinds of things. Now, those are all direct consumer genetic testing companies that anyone in the community theoretically has access to. They're not cheap, obviously. And so there's issues with, um, you know, who has access to these kinds of information. Um, but in terms of the extent to which these are utilized in um, healthcare settings, they're not. And I, I, I didn't have time to talk about this, but the level of information that we know about genetics of autism and ADHD is really not at the level for which we are confident that what we're finding is in fact all of what's contributing to autism or ADHD. These samples are still very underpowered in terms of detecting all the genetic uh, loci that are related to autism and, and ADHD and depression and schizophrenia, very heritable conditions. Um, but we are so far behind in this particular science in terms of identifying all the origins and causes of these conditions. And that's not counting the fact that the definition of these outcomes have morphed and changed over time, as you've heard about autism, which would lead to potentially other genes being identified down the line. So I, I have a, this has become a theme, but a healthy dose of skepticism towards the use of this type of technology, particularly in the context of complex traits like this. What we're doing in the lab is trying to understand the genetics of autism and ADHD together with the information that we have, but not relying on that tool solely in our view about what's causing this condition, right? So I showed you that multi-dimensional view that we're taking. Genetics is just one piece of that puzzle. And so I, I, I do think that we should be very careful. Um, it's it, everyone's right to access that information at this point, but we should be very careful about interpreting some of those results until we have a much better understanding about um, what what the genetics of these very complex traits really are. And we're not there yet. Great question. Thank you, Dr. Lee.